administration. I'm going to come back to practical matters in this very last furlong of the program, as it were. Um, people, uh, to get out of this, there are practical measures that could be expedited. Uh, now let's take the broad brush. Jonathan Friedland, do you think that America changing its foreign, foreign policy, uh, giving up its demands on, on, on the terrorists, do you think that would change things? Uh, there is a view that, look, American foreign policy is at least 50%, maybe more, to blame for this, change the foreign policy, change the situation. Yeah, this is the view, quoting Mao, that you know you can't catch the fish but you can drain the sea in which they swim and the, the, the sort of sea of grievances that enable or, or, or lead people to be recruited to Osama bin Laden's banner are really more or less the three demands he made. I mean, he didn't phrase them as demands, but uh, an end of support for Israel in its occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, although I think bin Laden would like to see Israel eradicated from the map altogether rather than just that. But let's say that. Second, American troops out of Saudi Arabia and third, an end of the war on Iraq. Now, the interesting thing is all three of those actually have good arguments on their side anyway. The problem is they've now become bin Laden's shopping list. And I just don't see how uh, the United States or actually anybody else in the so-called world community can be appearing to jump to his tune. I mean, the settlement that has taken 30 years in Northern Ireland may in a way reflect what was on the shopping list of the IRA 30 years ago. But the very fact that it was on their list meant it took three decades for it to happen because otherwise you look as if you're giving in to terror. So I think there's a real problem there. The other thing I would just add very practically is something that can be done is that people are get on the, in the, in the so-called West are going to have to learn about Islam. I'm looking for practical solutions now as we, as we enter this thing. I mean, I'm looking, I mean, that's ridiculous. But yeah. I, I think we should try to move towards yeah. that, right? If you said to Bush, you're, look, if you three things you could do, uh, if you could do anything you wanted and they would happen within a, a year, six months or so, uh, these are the three things you should set off doing. What would they be? I, I think that they would be so uh, impractical as to waste my breath saying them. Really? So I'm not going to. But what, what I would like to see... That suggests a certain hopelessness. Well, I don't want to be hopeless. Uh, I'm, I, I have four children, and like many people, I, I want to, a, a future for them. I don't want to see the world descend into a conflagration that once it gets out of hand, we can't put out the flames. And in a sense, we are pulling a genie out of a bottle that might be very, very difficult to get back into. And I think we should all be deeply aware of that. If I did say anything, I would say that business as usual has to stop. Uh, I really believe that the politicians have to, the Christians would call it metanoia. They have to make a repentance. I think that they need to, in Greek it means change your mind. And I think that, that the Machiavellian approach uh, to world politics is no longer viable after September 11th. So that's what I would say. What are his practical magnifications? Uh, it, it, the, the type of spin, the type of cynicism, uh, the type of damage control, the type of uh, 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 wills uh, in, in America called uh, Palestine. Palestine, he said, Palestine is not a problem because problems have solutions. Palestine is a mess and messes are managed. I think that that type of approach, uh, a cynical approach about human conditions that affect millions of people is no longer acceptable. So I would say that there has to be a deep change and I would hope that we reject Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations. It, it's an unacceptable, untenable proposition. Can I just drop in one thought about that, which is that often we focused, I think, on, and you, I did in my answer to your question about what the West should do. Part of this process, and I think we're hearing it from the two Muslims around this table, is a process of introspection in the Arab and Muslim world. Partly, there is a force to blame in the sense of American and other colonial powers who stopped those countries getting democratic open regimes and societies. But to wonder why it is that across that whole swathe of the world there aren't yet the democracies the open societies etc uh, that have been allowed to grapple with modernity I think there's a large amount of blame on America for, for propping up these vile regimes but there has to be some soul-searching on we both sides of this process. Yes. I, mean, there's, I there's agree a I... Reason. for example in Algeria when the FIS won an election in 94 the military junta suspended the election we did not have a major complaint about democracies. Um, you don't have demands for democratization in Saudi Arabia being initiated by the United States. Now, for example, the complaints about the Taliban regime and its misogynist policies is coming out. Yeah. But what similar policies have been in operating in Saudi Arabia for many, many years, you could argue. Um, similarly, like a but that is example. the kind of thing I'm talking about. No, People are not going to tolerate I, I, that much longer, no, I think. But I think the problem really comes down to is this, that you ask why we don't have democracies in there. I think the question is, what does democracy actually mean? And I think perhaps what we should recognize that perhaps in many of the so-called third world, democracy may be a tainted currency because it has always been possible for some countries to enjoy democracy at the expense of others having to endure dictatorship. And perhaps that's one of the things that we need to get away from. William Dalrymple. Well, I think there's been a, 
a denial in the US that, you know, that Middle Easterners dropping bombs in America has anything to do with American Middle Eastern policy. And the thing which, you know, the, the wound certainly that seems to be felt most keenly across the Islamic world is continual and often ridiculous um, support by America for, for Israel. When, when you see America vetoing resolutions to send observers even, just observers, to, to see what's happening to the Palestinians. When America steps in and uses its power to veto something, something so completely uncontroversial, um, uh, uh, when th that happens over and over again, when they see it being funded, this is the wound which, which separates most widely. Which, I mean, the, the thing about the US troops in, um, uh, in, in the Hejaz, that, that's a specifically Saudi grievance. So I've never heard people in India complaining about that. Um, well, but you do find Muslims in India complaining about Palestine. It is something that really means something to them, rightly or wrongly. It's something that really hurts. Jonathan? Well, I'm, well, I'm slightly doubtful about the, um, the Muslims across the uh, whole of the uh, Muslim world. I know that, for example, Kashmir is a hotter issue in India than and in Pakistan than Palestine is. I also just think this is part of the problem because, of course, if you're Palestinian, and frankly, even if you're a Muslim, you care about the mistreatment of Palestinians, you should. But I think instead that often gets interpreted into this is the source of all our problems. We live under a military dictatorship here in Pakistan because of Palestine. We live in desperate unemployment uh, in Morocco because of Palestine. And we're in, to use that cliche, the dark ages in Afghanistan somehow because of Palestine. This to but me seems to be an why, absolute diversion. Why they dislike and, and, and the US. And it doesn't hold up. It doesn't, it doesn't hold up for all their problems, but it does hold but up. Dislike the US dislike, yeah. for propping up their no, own no, vile regimes, no, as well as disliking them for the, what they do with this. Jonathan, one thing you're being slightly uh, unfair about is that, again, the reason the support for Palestine by the United States also means support for regimes that support Israel de facto. And that's one of the kind of arguments that goes around. So the reason why the Saudi royal family is allowed to get away with XYZ or Mubarak is allowed to win an election with 97% without a comment that actually elections with 97% are something even New Labour can't manage. So <laughs> there must be something going on here. Without even a comment like that, suggests to me that Mubarak is essential to keep maintain a certain Israeli policy. The United States policy towards the Muslim world as it exists largely is concerned about its relationship with Israel. See, again, I'm afraid that's just a, this it, is a, it's a delusion, because it's obviously delusion. it has an oil interest across the whole of this vast region. Well, You're right, the support for Israel is part of it, but it yeah. props up Saudi Arabia, not because of its support for Israel. Saudi Arabia is no supporter of Israel. I'll break that news to you. It's about oil. <laughs> and of course America props up those regimes. That's bad enough. You don't need what I think of as this slight diversionary tactic, which I admit, I think William's right. It's huge in the Muslim world. I slightly question how wise it is for a world that, from everything we've heard from Hamza and you, needs desperately some soul-searching and a process of change I think to let's, just let's, let's on all issue. sides. I think the West, we need to this become sense. introspective in the West, of course. and I think Muslims need to become introspective. I really think we all need to take a good look in the mirror, uh, you know, a, as a global community. Well, we have to end somewhere, and that's a good place to end. Thank you very much, Jonathan Friedland, Salman Saeed, William Dalrymple, and Hamza Youssef. Thank you. And thank you. Position.